Good evening all. I am Dr. Deepa Firke. I am the based on coordinator of Mahayapi uh, Women's Committee. I welcome you all in today's session on behalf of Mahayapi. In this uh, year, we have uh, witnessed a storm of academic and uh, social activities. I am sure that uh, most of our practitioners and parents have been uh, benefited by these activities. We are almost in the year end, but it's not yet over. So today we have come with one more interesting session, the Pulse in Perinatology. And on occasion of uh, the newborn week, which has been celebrated from 15 to 21st of November, we are having this session. Newborn is uh, the heart of our pediatric practice. And you might all agree with me that a good team of gynecologists and the uh, pediatricians can definitely need to uh, a better management of the newborn care. So with this aim, we will we have the student session. So before we start with the session, I would like to call upon our MAHIP president, Dr. Hemant Gangolia, sir, for his presidential address for the session. Please, sir. Thank you, madam. Good evening and namaste to all respected dignitaries as well as respected faculty, Dr. Rishikesh Thakre, Dr. Uh, Dr. Preeta Joshi, Madam, Dr. Chin Vaishali Joshi, Madam, as well as Dr. Chinmay Umarji, as well as fantastic moderators, Dr. Deepa Firke and Dr. Amol Girwalkar. Uh, and all those who are present on this dais, I see Dr. Ramakan Patil, Dr. Mohan Varke, and all the viewers on the YouTube channel. So this is today is the fifth day of Mahapedicon, continuing online. So we are not resting, but continuing with the fifth day of Mahapedicon. And uh, tomorrow also will be the sixth day, which will be of the Tuesday takes. And uh, with this, uh, today is the last day of the newborn week, which was 15th November to 21st November. And continuing with this, today is a, to conclude this newborn week, we are having a, this baby now and perinatology pearls and probably this fantastic uh, faculty, we will learn more things in perinatology, but that is a period which is a very crucial period and how to um, go about it. Probably the pearls and wisdom we are going to learn today. So wish each one happy learning and uh, all the best for this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to welcome our dynamic uh, secretary of my IP, Dr. Amol Pawar. Sir, please kindly uh, share your words of wisdom. I was told I was like, but the Thank you, Deepa, ma'am, for taking lead in conduction and execution of this very innovative online CME on pearls in new perinatology. I welcome all faculties and all delegates on behalf of Team Maha AP. CIP this year came with New idea of celebrating newborn week first time from 15th to 21st November. So the theme chosen is home care of newborn in urban area. So team Mahaipi with President Gangulia Sir's guidance formed a team to celebrate newborn week consisting of Dr. Deepa Firke, ma'am, then Dr. Avinash Bhusle, Dr. Kavish, Dr. Sandeep Patil from Nande, Dr. Neha Singh, Dr. Renu, Dr. Snail Nagre, Dr. Manjusha Shirkar. We released various flyers and videos of experts explaining how to care and cure the newborn starting from birth. Just we have finished Mahapedicon and during it we have conducted Hina workshop with 35 delegates. Those are trained for uh, 
doing the newborn high risk newborn assessment under the lead uh, this workshop was conducted under lead role of dr avinash bosle the all rounder pediatrician from jalga then dr anil khamkar neonatologist from pune dr kashmiri badbade dr ashwini marathe dr dinesh soral all are all were developmental pediatricians so today we are concluding the, this newborn week involving specialist Uh, involved in uh, work of perinatology we have dr rishikesh thakre dr vaishali joshi dr chinmay dr amol girwalkar my batchmate i once again thank deepa ma'am for uh, conduction and execution of this i wish all the delegates a happy learning thank you thank you sir i welcome uh, all the obis uh, dr jay kumar mandal sir the convener of myp and all other obis of myp for this session and uh, let's start with the session uh, we are blessed to have uh, renowned faculties for this session and i would like to introduce uh, these faculties to you dr pal neha can you please share the cvs of this faculties so our first faculty dr rishikesh thakre he is a senior consultant neonatologist from aurangabad he has vast uh, experience in the field of neonatology welcome sir our next faculty she is one of the best and the leading neonatal and pediatric intensivist working in kopeyapen hospital mumbai uh, she is none other than dr preeta joshi ma'am and we have heard her in almost all the intensive care conferences welcome ma'am dr vaishali joshi Uh, ma'am she is a senior consultant in obstetric and gynecology at kokra ben ambani hospital she is a specialist in high risk pregnancy as well as uh, the gynecology and endoscopic surgery and we are blessed to have her today and i am hope that she will uh, guide us today in this session our next faculty dr chinmay umar ji he is a fetal medicine specialist he is also a member of antenatal screening committee in government of maharashtra and the secretary of the fetal medicine society welcome sir and today as moderator we do have dr amol girwalkar who is working as a consultant neonatologist at kolapur and has have wide extensive neonatology work in the peripheries of western maharashtra that is kolapur so i will once again welcome all the dignitaries and the faculties and i hand over the proceedings to dr amol for the further session thank you so much and we would like to introduce our moderator convener or coordinator dr deepa firke who is the west zonal um, coordinator of the maha ip women committee and she did wonderful work in view of maha pedicon coming we had just i just talked to her if we want everything to be ready because after in maha pedicon we not get the time so all the videos and all the this prenatal webinar all were set before 17th only thanks dr deepa firke you have done very wonderful and fabulous work thank you sir thank you for giving me the opportunity thank you amol unmute kar do unmute kar unmute okay thank you iip for giving me this opportunity to moderate this session of the esteemed faculties uh sharing so uh uh it's a great pleasure to moderate this session uh, we have esteemed faculties from neonatology and obstetrics and fetal medicine so without wasting much of time i will directly move on to the session can you see can you see the screen no it not yet can you share yes. can you see yes this? coming coming yes. Yes. yes 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 okay so i will straight away go into the uh, cases and uh, uh, dr uh, vaishali madam yeah uh, dr preeta madam dr rushikesh sir and dr chinmay all are here yes sir yes. i will go ahead yeah. so i will go ahead with my first slide first case uh, Okay, this is a 35-year-old uh, primee 
and 30 weeks pregnancy this is the iv of conception and we are trying hard to conserve this pregnancy but the baby may deliver in next 4 to 5 days so vaishali madam uh, what is what should be the checklist of interventions for better outcome of uh, the baby yeah uh, the main thing in such scenario is to first thing is ideal will be a uh, in utero transfer if possible because a uh, 30 weeks ivf pregnancy uh, the baby will have a best uh, outcome if we do in utero transfer then the second list uh, second point will be to consider antenatal uh, Uh, steroids. It may be beta methasone or dexamethasone because um, uh, that will help the uh, pulmonary maturity. Then magnesium sulfate infusion for neuro protection. Uh, and obviously, we have to uh, discuss the mode of delivery to this patient because it depends on uh, depends on what is the reason we are. Uh, trying to deliver this pregnancy if it is a maternal comorbidities like severe preeclampsia or preterm labor then the fact that we have to stabilize the mother and then consider in utero uh, transfer so in all this discussion and contemplation the role of neonatologist and pediatrician is very important so there has to be a dialogue between the patient the uh, the unit where you are planning to do delivery and the obstetrician so the, this is these are the important things in your checklist okay uh, so the uh, this in this type of scenarios are frequently seen uh, by us so what is your like uh, take on delayed cord clamping so uh, delayed cord clamping is very important particularly at this stage uh, such a premature uh, uh, prematurity so it definitely has shown the benefits so i think uh, it is universally accepted and it should be followed so uh, as you rightly said madam now i will go to uh, rushikesh thakre sir So, in the same case, what are your expectations from your obstetric colleague, and what else you want to add to this? First and foremost is uh, uh, the pediatric team should be called prior to the delivery and have some time at least to prepare for the delivery. When I say I want time to prepare for the delivery, I'm looking at PPE. To me, PPE stands for person, place, and equipments. So, I need to have a team. Uh, ready prior to the arrival of this baby more importantly uh, the single most intervention which will help give this baby a good quick start is twofold a antenatal steroid course if possible whatever uh, even if the delivery is imminent i would urge that the antenatal steroids uh, come in and uh, second is to give antenatal magnesium sulfate two simple interventions but would have significant implications both short term and long term at this stage i would take the opportunity to talk about cord clamping and more importantly if the baby does not need resuscitation have clear roles and responsibilities identified as to how this process of cord clamping would take place and uh, we do know that delayed cord clamping is a simple low cost effective evidence based intervention which would have again immense benefit to this preterm baby more importantly if time permits this would be a good opportunity to sensitize the parents counsel them about what are our immediate concerns in the delivery room what problems we would anticipate and based on the uh, response of the baby in the delivery room thereafter we would take a call about uh, Uh, further counseling the parents periodically keeping them in the loop uh, of how the baby moves on and last but not the least while this happens it is equally important that the missing link or our weakest link and that is of transport is equally kept stand by so that we don't uh, miss on that uh, opportunity so these would be my ways of looking at this baby just as i am told that this baby is about to come 
Okay, sir, as you rightly said, you have covered all the points, and uh, I just wanted to ask you about uh, about uh, the delivery room uh, uh, CPAP, sir. Delivery room CPAP. What is your take on delivery room CPAP, sir? On this, okay, in this case, uh, there is no role of uh, prophylactic. Uh, CPAP in the delivery room. So that's one. Second is that the role of delivery room CPAP would be for those preterm babies who have difficulty in breathing, that means show evidence of respiratory distress or grunt or hypoxia. So in these babies, uh, the standard of care would demand that we would support, initiate with the uh, delivery room uh, CPAP two things are equally important. A, there has to be air oxygen which should be available in the delivery room and B, it has to be with a blender. And uh, obviously, if we look at uh, the peripheries, this is where the things would probably not be available and it would be uh, very unethical to deliver a CPAP with just oxygen or 100% oxygen or without the use of blender. And definitely, it also demands that we also have a pulse oximeter in place for safe delivery of CPAP. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so I will go uh, I will go further now. I just wanted to add a small point. I, I don't know if yeah. Rish, Rish, Dr. Rishikesh mentioned it, um, about antenatal magnesium sulfate. Uh, yeah. This is a candidate where we um, need to also think of antenatal magnesium sulfate to improve the neurodevelopmental outcomes. So, so magnesium sulfate uh, uh, was mentioned. And madam, what is the cutoff? Till what time we can give magnesium sulfate? Till what gestation we can give magnesium sulfate? So at present, uh, the many most of the studies and ACOG recommendations 34 weeks. Okay. So, but up to 36 weeks also, an expected return they have you can give. Okay, ma'am. So uh, I'll just conclude here and we'll go with the next case. So uh, uh, about the stabilization, everything has been covered here. Uh, about the uh, stabilization in delivery room, the a antenatal steroids, magnesium sulfate, a dialogue with the, uh, with the relatives, with the pediatrician, and this coordination also we have uh, discussed about the delayed cord clamping and also the delivery room CPAP, how uh, giving 100% oxygen is harmful. And if there is a blender, then we can go ahead with uh, a blended oxygen. So we'll go ahead with this. So we have covered everything into it. Now we will go ahead. Now this we'll uh, talk about some antenatal issues. Dr. Chinmay has joined. So uh, Dr. Chinmay, uh, how to interpret soft marker. There's a lot of controversies in period. We are talking since long and uh, there are so many updates also. So how to interpret soft markers? So, uh, Dr. Amol, many thanks for inviting me and uh, this wonderful perinatology meet. And I hope that more and more such meetings happen wherein we can exchange our thoughts and, you know, start working as better teams. Uh, and one such topic, of course, would be soft markers, which needs to be kind of informed to even the pediatrician beforehand, because say a soft marker like intracardiac echogenic focus, one out of three Indians have it. And the moment you say there is a spot on the heart, they think hole in the heart. So it needs a lot of, you know, affirmation. And there could indeed be a small VSD, which was not picked up antenatally. And then they might think that, you know what, my doctor or my sonologist did not do the right job. So it's very, very important that there is clarity of thought amongst the obstetric team, the sonology team, as well as uh, the neonatology team. And uh, when we come to uh, soft markers, um, especially, as you know, the term is now obsolete. We have started calling them as normal variants, emphasizing that they are normal. Uh, especially in our population, even a variant like uh, hypoplastic nasal bone is less likely to have uh, repercussions compared to a Caucasian nose, which is really sharp. So uh, when we start from the head to toe, uh, there could be uh, hypoplastic nasal bone, intracardiac echogenic focus, aberrant right uh, subclavian artery, short long bones of the arm and the thigh, that is humerus and the femur, mild uh, bilateral bi uh, pelvic diseases, so on and so forth. There are around 10 of them. And uh, I don't know if we have time. Uh, is it okay if I share my screen? 
for a second no sir no uh, no yeah. all right we, we i had an excel which i could not time. share actually uh, so this excel would would maybe i can later share it and uh, the yeah, delegates can, can do it later it. sir yeah, yeah. i have uh, created an excel which just shows how the soft markers can help us calculate the risks what we need to remember is that if there are two or more normal variants present then it may yeah. have significance however the ability of an anomaly scan to pick up a down syndrome is very poor at 56% so in the absence of all the soft markers also 44% of down syndrome babies may be missed because they will not show any so called soft markers so number one what i would like to tell uh, our esteemed delegates over here is that just because the anomaly scan was normal do not rely upon it for down syndrome if somebody has high risk in the first trimester then always 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 offer them a higher better sensitivity better specificity wala test say an nips or an invasive testing depending on what the results are like but because she was high risk in the first trimester do not go for a quadruple or an anomaly scan in the second trimester to negate that high risk she is still going to remain high risk i hope that answers your question yes sir so we'll go ahead sir with this and if time permits you please keep your excel sheet ready yes sir. So time permits i will definitely like to show this excel sheet to our yes. delegates so uh, now this is this is a case sir very uh, Uh, frequently we see this type of cases where this is a 33 year old female ivf conception she had high ivf failures in the past and she has no medical problems as of now at 22 weeks scan suddenly can you see the, the scan sir suddenly it is seen that there is ventricular megaly yes now the lateral ventricle uh, right lateral ventricle measuring 11 mm and left lateral ventricle me- measuring 10.7 so borderline suppose this is 12 Or suppose this is twelve point five. Yes. Then, uh, so how to go ahead with this at twenty two weeks, sir? Yes, sir. So at mild, uh, isolated. So here there are many other findings which I would like to really understand better. Like there is third ventricle dilatation. I also want to take a look at corpus callosum. For the time being, let us just focus on bilateral mild ventricular megaly. Yes. Oh, uh, because that is more common a finding, isn't it? Yes. And very, very confusing. The moment you tell the parents that there is something in the brain, a swelling in the brain, they are going to go nuts. Oh, uh, they are going to say what's going to happen. And rightly so, many of my obstetric colleagues would also panic. Oh, uh, what we need to understand here is that we know the brains which we see in the ultrasound. There are so many brains beyond who never are reported to us. so our understanding of brain on ultrasound and overall is minuscule at the best also we don't have large population data about behavioral patterns developmental disabilities etc especially for indian population now if you look at the western literature that will tell you that a, a ventricular megaly in the range of 10 to 12 mm it should be classified as mild uh parents should be counseled that this may or may not progress but in 90% of the cases it will not progress uh you need to rule out other associations with it so you need to do a thorough scan rule out the spine look at other central defects and peripheral defects and if there are associated defects uh, there then of course your counseling will change however isolated ventricular megaly on a scan and an cmri which is coupled with an invasive testing with a cma as well as exome sequencing please remember that exome especially for brain adds 44% extra data so uh, it gives much more information and for brain always 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 go for exome um, as a first line test and if both of these are normal and you have ruled out other factors then you can safely tell your patient that the outcomes of isolated ventricular megaly are probably at going to be at par with that of general population which means a developmental disability of 5 to 10% i want to ask one more question here this is a 20 this is a 22 week scan yes sir and uh, suppose like you have the ruled out the other anomalies and there is no other anomaly this is isolated ventricular megaly now it is 11 mm but let's say it is 12 12.5 mm 
and uh, no other findings so in that case uh, doing a exome sequencing it will take a lot of time so it will take another four, three to four weeks Absolutely. and the cut off is 24 weeks for terminating so how to go about saying this so i'm so glad that you asked this question because uh, this was the very question uh, which i was facing when i decided to move back to india from ireland i was like what am i going to do giving a diagnosis at 20 21 weeks i cannot see uh, brain better before 22 and i'm going to be really a useless tool in the kitty of my indian patients so when i came back uh, i started hunting for options and uh, the ray of hope i found was dr nikhil datar from mumbai uh, as you know he's an obstetrician and a gynecologist and uh, he back then like if i remember 2008 9 she had filed a case uh, one nikita mehta versus union of india for Down syndrome at 22, 23 weeks, and dad uh, lost that case. Uh, five, six years down the line, I met him, I think, in 2016, wherein we requested him if uh, he has found any answer to this question, and he indeed had. He had filed one case and won successfully uh, for an anomaly beyond 20 weeks. Uh, I also joined this movement. Uh, we uh, filed first case from Pune in Supreme Court, uh, which was about a spina bifida detected at 22 weeks, a laborer from Karnataka. And we successfully won that case at 23 weeks. And since then, till uh, the law changed, when we uh, noticed, we had filed around 192 cases uh, from uh, across the country, uh, majority of them from Pune, but uh, we helped many people in Bangalore, even in uh, Northeast, Delhi, um, Chhattisgarh, Kolkata, to file cases. There is an NGO which files the cases on patients' behalf, so they don't charge much. High court cases, so Supreme Courts uh, initially welcomed our cases, then they got fed up of us, they referred us to high courts. Uh, and eventually, they again went back to the parliament, uh, the draft was created, HRLN, the NGO which helped us file the cases was also involved in consulting the Supreme Court. And our own Dr. Aparna Sharma ma'am from AIMS uh, has uh, formed the new, new MTP Act. So uh, now the new MTP Act in a way has made our life much easier. Up to 20 weeks, single gynecologist can offer termination. From 20 to 24 weeks, legally, in all those centers which used to offer uh, it up to 20 weeks, depending on the appropriate authority and uh, the uh, government authorities locally, uh, between 20 and 24 weeks, we can file cases. Uh, I mean, we can uh, offer termination even without filing cases. Beyond 24 weeks now, you don't need to go to the courts anymore you have got a permanent medical board at designated hospital. So for example, in Pune, uh, our BJ Medical College has got a, a medical board. And I'm proud to say that they have been very, very proactive. Uh, they have been excellent. So even before the law changed, I remember at 30 weeks, I got a farmer from interiors of uh, Talega, a 22 year old girl. Again, just to tell you, because 22 year old, you can get Down syndrome. She had absent nasal bone at 19 weeks scan, was offered a quadruple marker, which was marked as low risk. Again, do not offer a quadruple marker if you see something on the scan. And then uh, we saw her at around 30 weeks with growth restriction, absent nasal bone. I did an amnio at 31 weeks, got a report at 32 weeks, which suggested that there is uh, Down syndrome. We filed the case and at 33 weeks, I was given permission. So, so, so I given, so there, there are ways out. So you want to say yeah, that there are yeah. ways out. Yeah. You want 24 weeks also. Yeah, we, can, yeah. we can go legally and we can, uh, in such cases, uh, courts are now having uh, retriever judgments and we can go ahead. Absolutely. So that, that's a very good information for us, sir. So by stick now, uh, so that is a very good information for all of us. So uh, that, that will be noted by all our delegates now. Uh, so uh, about the say ventricular megaly cases, uh, what is the role of fetal surgery? So what is the place of fetal surgery? Is there any role for a severe uh, ventricular megaly? Uh, is it debatable, sir? Uh, uh, the, there is some uh, evidence that it may, so ventricular amniotic shunts uh, may help, but the data is uh, very limited at the moment. Uh, so as far as uh, majority of the places are concerned, especially when we are talking about periphery, probably fetal surgery is still hypothetical. Okay, sir. So thank you for making that clear. 
uh, how do you, how do like uh, sir now uh, uh, i will move to uh, takre sir rushikesh takre sir sir in case of ventricular megalis uh, when you see at birth uh, uh, on screening ultrasounds uh, in uh, neonates or in the premature babies uh, uh, which were not detected previously or because of uh, interventricular hemorrhages uh, sticking to the ventricles itself so how to monitor these cases sir how do we evaluate and treat this uh, postnatal ventricular dilatations you have a baby who has come with uh, ventricular dilatation yes uh, we need to say what is the cause of the ventricular dilatation so, so the cause is... here could is likely to be a structural cause which is the commonest especially if it has been prenatally diagnosed in that case we would be able to identify and treat the cause the second important factor is are there associate anomalies minor or major dysmorphism which would could suggest that this is a genetic disorder yes so these are two things that we need to look at clinically okay. uh, assess the baby as a whole and do we have a syndromic pattern to suggest that there is a intrauterine infection torch complex kind because that is another common condition which would come with uh, ventricular megaly and uh as a nicu graduate the commonest cause of ventricular dilatation would be a sequelae to grade 3 grade 4 uh, uh intraventricular mm-hmm. hemorrhage in these nicu graduates that would pick up and follow up at around 2 or 4 weeks yeah. irrespective of that as and when you find a ventricular megaly this baby has to be kept under clinical uh supervision you would repeat ultrasound uh and track the ventricular index and the anterior horn cell width of this baby serially and uh, if it happens to be beyond 97th percentile or the anterior horn cell width is uh, beyond 9 mm it would suggest that this baby would need some neurosurgical intervention now there it all depends upon availability of resources for example if you have facilities to serially do an ultrasound that's best simply because you would be able to track and intervene early in case the this is not feasible the other option is to look at clinically by that i mean look at the pulsatility of the anterior fontanel fullness and more importantly the sutures and monitor the head circumference based on which you would get an idea as uh, is it the same and at any stage you find that there is a features to suggest a raised intracranial pressure we would again need a neurosurgical intervention there would be an option based on unit experience but which is not a standard of care to do serial lumbar punctures to reduce the intracranial pressure or to put a ventricular reservoir or to use some fibrinolytic therapies but these are uh, anecdotal not based on evidence so for all practical purposes the point is a baby with ventricular dilatation needs follow up uh, there is a critical threshold which would predict that this baby is at risk for developing neuro developmental sequelae and Uh, the point is at any time you have features to suggest raised intracranial pressure or a increasing uh, ventricular index or a anterior horn cell width distance which we talked about a need for placement of a shunt and more importantly these babies need a holistic comprehensive evaluation rather than just looking at the ventricles simply because we need to look also at the motor development visual assessment hearing assessment and then take a call and keep the parents informed Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, no, Dr. Amul, Dr. Amul, can I say something? One or yeah. two things. One or two things I want to say regarding yes. first case. Whatever was stated, it is always better to um, uh, transport initially only, and parent counsel is very important at the place where all the facilities of the neonatal care is available. Now to eliminate the uh, uh, the transport thing from the periphery to the uh, city. The secondly, whatever Dr. Umarji has say, stated about is. The question arises: if There should be a very means. I apply. I have a mental issue. Some other within gynecology, substitution, pediatrician. Malla asa man is a because these issues will be coming on and the case filing will be going on. But I want to ask one question, and that is: What are the ideal time to do the anomaly scan rather than sending USG uh, at this week at this week at a routine center? So whether there is a role of doing advanced scan. or anomaly scan at what time with a reference to the literature which will support us if any case is filed so so that's a very good question and uh, 
I think man is much better than the machine, isn't it? So I think you have to focus on the expertise of the operator and you have to know who are good operators and who are not. And I'm sure your other radiology colleagues uh, can, of course, uh, handhold uh, your local uh, radiologist or uh, fetal medicine specialist if it comes to that. Uh, the ideal time uh, now is uh, changing rapidly with bigger and better machines, more da uh, data and more expertise. Now we have started doing anomaly scan in very much the first trimester at 12 weeks. And uh, it can help you rule out as many as 50% of the anomalies. Another 30% addition can happen with an additional anomaly scan at around 19 weeks and then again at 23 weeks. Why do you still want to do it at 19? Because the very reason you just mentioned that if I find something obvious at 19, I'll get uh, enough time to investigate, get exome, as Dr. Amol rightly said, it takes a month to come back and then still be within the confines of the new act, which is 24 weeks and terminate safely if the parents wishes so. Uh, Again, you should have a delayed anomaly scan because there are evolving anomalies and we keep telling everybody that each scan is an anomaly scan. You can detect anomalies at first trimester, second trimester, and even at third trimester. So we need to work on that. And of course, all of that should be so. What we do in our case notes is uh, we work in a perinatology unit. So we have uh, in-house geneticists and uh, uh, neonatologists, pediatric surgeon. So we put in a high-risk box and we keep documenting everything there so that at the time of delivery, even if you are busy with the patient, uh, your neonatologist comes to know about everything. Okay, what uh, I have understood, like what we all have understood is that we need more such perinatology needs yes. on specific topics so that uh, so that this can be elaborated more. Absolutely. We'll on the topic, topic today and this will give us a clear idea also in, in future also. Okay, so I'll go ahead now and uh, only I'll go ahead with this case. This is a in a targeted anomaly scan. Uh, we see a lot of uh, congenital cyanotic uh, uh, this, uh, cardiac diseases, and uh, these conditions are usually terminated all the time. So when these are detected at 22 weeks of gestation, like TGA or TAPVC, in this case, uh, what is your take on uh, termination of pregnancy, Dr. Umarji? So. Even in our uh, countries now, the uh, success rate of, and Dr. Preetha can correct me if I'm wrong, but the success rate of surgical correction, uh, as far as the survival is concerned, has improved drastically to the tune of 80, 85, 90% for these anomalies. Uh, there could be uh, an issue about neurological outcomes, and uh, that is something probably uh, which all of us need to keep in mind. Termination, of course, is parents' very private choice, isn't it? So I think our job is to sit down with them and make them understand what are the outcomes of survival, cost, intact survival, neurological outcomes, and let them take that call. And at some point of time, some parents would say that we want termination, even though the success rate is very good, and maybe we'll have to comply. Of course, take multidisciplinary team meeting like we are having right now to discuss each and every case and then only offer that termination. Uh, uh, Preeta, madam. So what are the, uh, in the same case, what are your views, ma'am? Yeah, so like uh, Dr. Chinmay just mentioned, uh, our success rates are beyond 90% for uh, both these situations in most centers in India right now. Um, and it's only getting better. Uh, it's also getting better because now with the antenatal detection, the in utero transfers are also happening which was not happening earlier. So the babies used to be born at peripheral centers and be transported with a lactate of 20, extremely cyanotic uh, with saturations of 30, 40, which is not happening anymore, at least happening much lesser. We do get babies like that still. So that improves outcomes as well. So the neurodevelopmental outcomes are also getting better because of the early transfer. So both of these are working uh, towards betterment in uh, most congenital cyanotic, except in univentricular hearts. So where you have left-sided hypoplasia more than the right-sided hypoplastic, right-sided still do better, but both the hypoplastic left hearts and right heart will need two to three surgeries, uh, which are complex surgeries. So 
that is one situation where it is a uh, it's good to do a good uh, uh, antenatal counseling and uh, i would even direct the parents a little bit towards termination when it is hypoplastic left heart uh you have made it clear so like you are uh, the success rates are almost more than 90% uh, but this is uh, what about the cost involved in this ma'am like if, uh, as so dr marji has rightly said that this should be individualized uh, discussed uh, regarding the uh, regarding all the aspects and the finance also so what is the cost involved in uh, when the patient comes antenatally and postnatal what is the cost involved in for example a tga yeah so for example most of the uh, hospitals now who are offering congenital cardiac surgery are usually tied up with some of the schemes so we uh, you know some of the hospitals have rbsk rajiv gandhi etc etc so which actually brings down the cost uh, but anyway if you do a complex heart disease which is usually a one time suppose it's a one time surgery like a switch for tga or a ta pvc repair it could go into the range of 3 to 3.5 lakhs and this usually includes 15 to 20 days of stay so that's not really bad unless that's the right. child comes very sick preoperatively which will not get included yeah. in the yeah. package yeah. so that's great so then when now the, uh, the delegates that uh, have joined they should uh, they are they are uh, listening our discussion so even if uh, a antenatal scan shows at 22 weeks that there is a tgh or ta pvc a correctable one time correctable anomaly we can add go positively on uh, into it and we can find out the centers where this can be done and in a in affordable cost so i will go ahead with this so uh, let's skip this uh, so there is a 22 weeks gestation uh, uh, with the bilateral bilateral uh, the ap diameter of 12 mm and 11 mm respectively right and left at 22 weeks so dr umar ji sir uh, what uh, is your uh, like in this cases of antenatal pilectasis what is significant pilectasis and how frequently should we monitor because many times it happens that uh, in mild cases also there is the frequency is more uh, so what are, are there any special normograms for this um a oh, very good question again sir so yes there are indeed special normograms and uh, the anterior posterior diameter of the renal pelvis could be considered to have even mild pilectasis at a value of as low as 5 mm at 19 weeks so uh, the nomogram kind of increases uh, the normal limit of anterior posterior diameter from 4 mm at 19 to around 7 mm at full term and uh, the uh, swelling above that would usually be considered as mild pilectasis uh, as it increases and when it reaches these ranges of uh, moderate pilectasis uh, we would be slightly more worried about these babies but of course uh, even with mild pilectasis you want to rule out other uh, normal variants which can be associated with aneuploidies uh, you also want to tell their uh, patients in these cases that uh, some of them may worsen and uh, renal ap diameter of 11 and 12 mm is more likely to worsen compared to a diameter of say 6 uh, or 7 mm and if they worsen they'll of course damage the kidneys you want to look at the lyca around them so the probable causes could be an obstruction to the outflow it could be at the level of the uh, pelvic ureteric junction or at the uh, more commonly at the uh, urethral outlet so lower urinary tract obstruction in which case you'll see a bilateral uh, pelvic disease like this and luto is going to subsequently keep damaging the kidneys and then have poorer outcomes so uh, when it comes to frequency of monitoring i would usually keep it at two weekly intervals but at 11 and 12 mm at 22 weeks i would of course like to sample this baby and understand uh, how genetically the baby is doing uh, if all of that is yes sir yeah so about the in the past uh, uh, we used to have uh, in severe cases uh, we used to go ahead with uh, some antenatal interventions so what is the uh, uh, 
present scenario of those antenatal interventions about the investigation that we do like beta 2 microglobulin so what is the uh, what is the present uh, uh, situation of or what is the present uh, uh, advance recent advances about it so what we used to do before for luto especially was that we would uh, usually sample the bladder uh, empty it out of the urine and then let it refill idea being that you are now sampling the urine from the kidneys and then test it for uh, abnormality, which would indirectly tell you whether there is a renal parenchymal damage. Uh, a, it has been not proven to be consistently correlating. B, uh, the idea was to put in a vasico amniotic shunt after this procedure because you have proven that probably kidneys are still forming urine, so they are more likely to be okay later. Uh, now, when you look at the clinical correlation of uh, this intervention, it has been proven beyond doubt that it is not useful. It does not improve uh, renal function. It does not give benefit to the baby. There are few centers in India which are still trying and selecting uh, the uh, posterior urethral valves wherein uh, now we have started doing uh, fetal uh, uh, urethroscopy and then um, burning the membrane. But again, uh, if you look at the Western data, it's not proven to be working. There is a significant belief, uh, believer behind this thought that you can carefully select the cases and some of them are going to do well. But as of now, data doesn't support that. So the fetal surgery for this, again, is gone into disrepute. So, Thakri, sir, now uh, many times it happens that patients are not worked off well and in a particular scan, you come to know that uh, there is a significant when uh, this AP the epidermitis are more severe type, uh, the bladder is distended, there is oligohydranus also, and uh, then they are delivered. So mostly they are in the later gestation, they are delivered. So what is the postnatal management and how do we prognosticate these cases? Sir, so <clears throat> here, uh, uh, we must remember the decision making will be based on the third trimester uh, renal pelvis AP diameter in the transverse plane. So that's a the decision making will be based on uh, what has been uh, the renal pelvis diameter there. So by and large, now if you say that there was a bilateral moderate to severe hydronephrosis or there was associated uh, bladder which was palpable, which is suggestive of an obstructive uropathy, or if there is a solitary kidney, in such situations, one would do an urgent ultrasound within the first 48, 72 hours. However, if uh, it is a mild hydronephrosis, where uh, it is somewhere between 5 to 10 millimeters, the AP diameter, renal pelvis, uh, one would need to confirm by doing a postnatal ultrasound after 48 hours when physiological oliguria disappears. So at that stage, one would be able to get a clear picture to identify what is the status of the uh, <coughs> uh, kidneys. Now, by and large, if it is between 5 to 10 millimeters uh, hydronephrosis, one would, uh, and the baby is otherwise well, and this is... Uh, Presuming that A, the renal parenchyma is normal, the ureter is normal, the bladder uh, is normal, and this is an isolated hydronephrosis, we would repeat an ultrasound at six weeks. For those babies with moderate to severe hydronephrosis, one would do an MCU, and then this would be MCU would be done at around four to six weeks, followed by a renal isotope scan to take a further call. The decision for starting antibiotic prophylaxis will be only if you have a documented grade 3 or grade 4 VUR, the vesicouretric reflux, not routinely otherwise. For those babies where there is moderate to severe hydronephrosis or features to suggest obstructive uropathy, one would in addition do an urine routine microscopy and a culture if required and a serum creatinine and or electrolytes to stabilize the baby. But by and large, majority of the babies would need a periodic follow-up and this uh, picture completely gets clear by about two years of age when we would know which of these babies would need further interventions or which of them are going to settle on their own. The key point here is that the parents have to be counseled that under no circumstances for any fever they would initiate with antibiotics. They must be told that if at all antibiotics have to be started, a urine examination is mandatory prior to giving these 
uh, babies any course of antibiotics. So that's uh, something that we need to be uh, specified upon. The surgical intervention is very clear. If you have significant hydronephrosis, by that means it's beyond 20 to 30 millimeters bilateral. Yes, if it is associated with a dysplastic kidney on the other side, yes, you would go ahead or you have grade three, grade four uh, um, VUR, you would need a surgical evaluation for these babies. And uh, the uh, isotope scan wherein we would do it every six months to look at the renal function. At any time, the renal function is below 40%. Yes, you need to do a surgical evaluation or it drops by about 10% of its previous value. Again, you would need to do a, a surgical correction. But by and large, all these babies need to be followed up uh, for their growth and uh, one would uh, be very vigilant that we would not miss or partially treat a urinary tract infection in these babies, which would be very hazardous otherwise. Okay, sir. By uh, you have made many of uh, our points clear, so I will go ahead uh, with the next case. And uh, this is a term baby born to a twenty-five years old primary mother. No medical issues with the mother. So. Uh, uh, born at uh, almost 39 weeks and birth weight is 3 kg. Baby is depressed at birth. So there, the, in spite of a good perinatal and antenatal management, uh, the baby was depressed and baby did not cry, required background mass shifted to NICU and the further management was done by NICU. Now, I want to ask, ask Vaishali Mani, uh, what are the safe uh, practices in this type of, in, in these cases? How the legal aspects, especially. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very good question because uh, uh, it's a completely low risk pregnancy, not anticipated uh, uh, this kind of a neonatal outcome. So first thing, documentation point of view, I think it's very important for us to um, make sure the uh, fetal heart rate monitoring, how was it done? Uh, was there any, how was a, how, uh, how how difficult was the second stage of labor? And was there any operative delivery um, done? So all this documentation is very, very important. The other thing is the uh, presence of pediatrician and uh, whether uh, the immediate uh, resuscitation, whether there has been any delay. And the third thing is uh, cord, uh, cord pH or a segmented clamp cord, uh, and particularly paired cord samples uh, will be the most important thing from medical legal point of view uh, to support that there was no evidence of HIE. I know there is not a complete, um, uh, so this will be helpful in a court of law just to, uh, uh, just to establish that there hasn't been any intrapartum um, uh, hypoxia. Okay, uh, Prita, madam, what uh, what is your uh, take on what is the significance of cord blood ABG in this case or any case? Sometimes it acts as a double-edged sword also. So, what? Uh, uh, how will you explain this? Yeah. So, um, in this case, of course, it has uh, extreme relevance because you uh, this child came depressed at birth and needed resuscitation. So. For sure, uh, the cord AVG is extremely important in this case because um, to label uh, birth asphyxia, uh, one of the criteria is to look at the pH. And if the pH is less than 7 or the base deficit is um, around minus 16 or more, uh, we have to consider this as um, asphyxia, which has happened probably immediate antenatal or it could be during the process of the last process of birth. Uh, however, it will help us in the definition of asphyxia itself. So um, it is extremely important to send a cord ABG. Suppose a cord ABG has not been sent. And many times, you like this child, we didn't expect. And suppose a cord ABG got missed out. Um, in this baby, uh, we can do it within the first half an hour. Uh, it will be very close to what uh, the um, cord ABG would be. Okay. So uh, the same baby... Uh, has convulsions at 24 hours of life and labeled at HIE. And relatives are panic and uh, 
We want to know the reason for the convulsions and their concern about the perinatal depression or the asphyxia, hypoxic, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. How to prognosticate uh, such cases? So um, at this point, yeah, so the convulsions usually in asphyxia happens within the first 12 hours, 20, uh, and then up to 24 hours. So 24 hours is little later uh, than usual. Usually it comes up in the first 12 to 24 hours. Um, so um, at this point, because of the history of being depressed at birth, needing resuscitation, um, I would still call this as, label this as HIE at this point. Uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, with convulsions, it becomes grade two by the Sarnath staging, becomes stage two. Um, and uh, uh, this child um, is, uh, so prognosis wise, for HI stage two, um, they have um, long term, at least 25%, up to 25% can have some form of neurodevelopmental disability. So that at this point would be highlighted. But again, we should be doing a, a MRI. Typically, we do a diffusion weighted MRI, um, preferably in the uh, at the end of the second to third day. Uh, but between the third to fifth day is the best period to do it, so that we can pick up um, early injury in the brain, which usually translates as permanent injury when we do MRI at two to three months of age. Okay. So the best timing as per you is for doing for, for, for prognostication uh, is three to five days and MRI. So uh, that is the best investigation as per you. And, yeah. uh, no, no CT scan should be done okay. and I won't do an ultrasound also. Okay. Now, uh, this in this case, uh, this also behaved weird, uh, very late uh, presentation of convulsions. And uh, uh, at present, we are, the, the neonatologists are doing a lot of this uh, post uh, diagnosing, over diagnosing uh, post COVID multisystem instrumental syndromes. So we also did this and uh, we, we found that everything was uh, in line and this was again labeled as. Uh, uh, neonatal multisystem inflammatory syndrome, a rare case. Now, all the cases are not rare. It is, uh, the, but uh, definitely there was some indication in this case that something is different. What are the other causes of depressed babies at uh, at birth other than HIV? I, I wanted to ask about the mimics, the asphyxia mimics, or other causes of uh, of uh, encephalopathies other than hypoxia. So in our country, I mean, one of the things is uh, if uh, based on the history, maternal history, the mother has had uh, fevers, tachycardia, leaking PV. Uh, you can have a child who's fulminantly septic also presenting uh, as a depressed baby. Um, you can have last minute cord um, ruptures or cord accidents, which could present like this. Um, you could have uh, spinomuscular uh, atrophy, SMAs, which will present um, the similarly, or significant cerebral um, defects, which can present as a depressed baby as well. So, uh, regularly following up baby with the gynecologist for nine months, uh, mother with the gynecologist for nine months. So, definitely, the uh, this is a shock for the uh, obstetrician. Uh, more as compared to the pediatrician, but uh, and uh, so this this is a gray area where there uh, all uh, asphyxias are labeled as hypoxic. Uh, uh, all the parental depressions depressions are labeled as hypoxic. So how uh, should we counsel or how should we coordinate in cases in all cases of uh, depressed babies? Um, once the baby is born and you have done the resuscitation, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, once this is done, like I mentioned initially, now this baby, if you are taking it as HI, will also be uh, counseled for hypothermia. So um, we would start this baby on a therapeutic hypothermia as well in the first six hours um, yes. of age. Um, and subsequently, I think it's very important the obstetrician and the neonatal just first have a dialogue and then talk to the family together because this is something major for the family. Uh, and where we be very transparent about everything that had been done from the obstetric side, from the neonatal side, and uh, then prognosticated with neuroimaging, etc., and put the whole picture together so that when we, uh, so typically we like to speak to them once the MRI is done. First two days, I usually tell them that we are critical, but it's very early to say how much 
because we want to have some um, real image that we can show them. So it's good to have an MRI before we talk to them in great detail. So in the beginning, we can say that we are critical. We are probably facing effects of hypoxia and ischemia. And we are looking at all possible causes that could have caused it and speak to them openly about it. Okay. okay. And be positive because, again, it's not that all the HIEs do badly, right? So it's very yeah. important to be positive also. It's except for HIE stage 3 and even in that, we've seen um, with hypothermia, many of them not doing that badly now. So I think with Dr. Vaishali only, we've had a few babies who have done yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Usually what happens is that uh, baby doesn't cry and uh, has convulsions and the uh, whole environment changes and we go ahead with uh, for prognostication and just withdrawing the support. So this is uh, this is the reason we uh, you know, included this case here. Right, right. No, so I don't think we should withdraw support unless we are dealing with an HI stage 3, really bad case where uh, post hypothermia also we are not seeing any improvement. Uh, at that point is when we would discuss that. Um, I think we should give it a good chance for uh, the therapy to work uh, and the diagnosis to help us before we even discuss withdrawal. So any case... I don't know what Rishikesh wants to add to that. Yes, sir, what do you want? do you want to add something to it, sir? Thakri, sir? Just that uh, this baby threw up a conversion at 24 hours of age, and uh, therefore, this itself doesn't become a candidate to be offered therapeutic hypothermia. Yes, if you have been there in the delivery room and in the first six hours you have this baby being labeled and it meets the laid down criteria. So that's one. More importantly, if I don't have an MRI, because not everybody would be as privileged as Pita to be able to do a day three, day five MRI, mm -hmm. I would go by a clinical because it's not going to change my management. So what I would look at at the time of hospital discharge is the best time that I get to know what is going to happen to this baby where I warn the parents. One is that I look for a how much uh, the majority of these babies should be off anticonvulsants at the time of hospital discharge. So if you end up with two or more anticonvulsants, we know that this baby is likely to end up with significant problems. That's one. Number two is look at the head circumference. Keep a track of the head circumference because that's the simple, most effective predictor in the first three months of age for future, irrespective of whether you do it any neuroimaging or not. So that's one. Thirdly, uh, if this baby at the time of hospital discharge is still on tube feeds, is not on breast feeds, that itself tells us that this baby is at significant risk for neuro disability. So that's where the story begins. And uh, last but not the least, is look for the abnormalities of tone. If you find the baby to have abnormalities in tone, that itself again is a good predictor at the time of hospital discharge. So these are few simple things. And if you have to do an MRI in low resource settings, I would say do it at one time, and that is three months of age, where you do a clinical assessment, do a developmental assessment, and more importantly, look at the MRI. Now, interpret all the three things together. By that time, you would have now all interventions in place that we have to start with. Because even if I make some uh, uh, diagnosis in the first five days, it's not going to change the course in any way. So... Uh, that's the way by which uh, in low resource settings one could uh, have a look at these babies. This gives you an opportunity to uh, inform the parents the need for developmental surveillance simply because otherwise they will be lost to follow up and they will come at 9 months, 12 months to say the baby is not holding it. It's too late. We have lost the uh, window of opportunity. So in the discussion we have seen that in high risk settings and high resource settings and low resource settings how to go about uh, so high resource setting, definitely, if you are having resources, we can go ahead with what uh, Dr. Pita, Madam said that uh, MRI on day three to day five to, uh, for prognostication. And in low resource settings, we can go clinically, more clinically, we can see the tone, we can see, uh, the, uh, we can uh, see whether uh, the baby is taking a lot of time for uh, oral feeds and is on two feeds at discharge and head circumference monitoring. So. So both things we have discussed. So we'll go ahead with our last case here. So this is a uh, very rare scenario, but a shocking scenario. Day two, male baby born out of third degree consanguinity and uh, to a primary mother at age of uh, 32. Baby was in postnatal ward and was found unresponsive. It was rushed to the emergency room 
and there was no respiratory effort heartbeats were not audible so the baby was brought dead at that time so history wise baby cried immediately after birth baby was feeding uh, well on breast and baby was pink at birth as of the history and no history of sudden death in the family so in this case of a sudden neonatal death how to proceed in this case in in case of unexplained neonatal death thakre sir how to go ahead okay uh the sudden neonatal death can happen in uh, it the your approach completely depends upon where this death took place simply because it may happen in the postnatal ward as it happened here yes it may happen at home or it may happen in the nicu itself sudden uh, neonatal death for a baby who was otherwise uh, brought for some reason or the other so uh, common things first now if this baby has uh, been brought from the postnatal ward we need to look thoroughly at the history and do a top to toe examination now many a times the commonest uh, thing that happens is if the mother is asleep or the mother is sedated or is still under the effect of anesthesia and you feed the baby or make an attempt to feed the baby there is no supervision which happens and you end up with a aspiration or you end up with choking and the baby would then be uh, so this is uh, one common scenario which happens in the postnatal ward the age also here is important simply because sudden death tells us that did we miss maybe by 24 hours of age or more a critical congenital heart defect these would just deteriorate uh, and before anything you would have lost the baby so the point here is uh, the age of the baby here would be very critical thirdly uh, the option therefore post is that uh, so one is this uh, aspiration or choking spell that has to be ruled out second is that did we miss a congenital critical congenital heart defect thirdly even if there is some heart please put this baby on an ecg monitor simply because uh, many a times uh, you would have an arrhythmia which is there which would prognost which would help us in identifying the underlying etiology and long qt syndrome sort of runs in the family and you would end up again with an arrhythmic episode which resolves by treatment to reveal the underlying abnormal pathology if you have access the best is to have such all babies who are Uh, deteriorating or are uh, collapsing in front of you to do a urgent bedside point of care ultrasound of the head of the heart and uh, also look at the gi means the uh, put a probe also on the abdomen simply because you may have an endocrine intracranial anomaly which uh, uh, would predispose to uh hypoventilation because of raised intracranial pressure which otherwise had been missed you could have an underlying heart disease which will be easily picked up and also if uh, so th- that would be if you are in a situation where this uh, you have access to point of care ultrasound but majority of the times uh, you would think in terms of an inborn error of metabolism never ever in the first to last of life you need to feed the baby allow that feed to take place which in turn will uh, make that inborn error of metabolism manifest so in the first 12 hours i would never ever think in terms of an inborn error of metabolism and uh, therefore the option is baby is brought dead we have documented death there is nothing that is pinpointing what would you do now here is where is the role of deciding the gold standard of care that we have to offer to these parents one is do we need a clinical autopsy what does it mean sudden unexpected medical death and here it is done by a pathologist the decision making will not be based on the external examination by the pathologist but will be based on the internal examination and histopathology which will give the final diagnosis so that's the role of clinical uh, autopsy in this case second option is that of a medical legal autopsy it is done by a forensic fellow now this would be where we have suspicion of foul play or things that do not meet your clinical uh, or uh, clinical correlation cannot fit into that picture that is where you would do and the third option that we have is to do what is called as a metabolic autopsy what does it mean that means that you need to do basic collect some samples so i would collect a blood sample at least 10 ml collect it 
uh, a urine sample and a CSF sample, store it, uh, blood and uh, CSF at minus 20 degrees Celsius, a urine sample at around 4 degrees Celsius. The blood sample will be of help. If you want to do a DNA study, you would need an EDTA. If you want to do a chromosomal study, you would need a heparin sample. So you need to collect and keep that for an explained date, simply because this will help in prognostication for the next pregnancy. So that is what, uh, and if you have a uh, suspicion, then you may do a biopsy of whatever organ that you think is the culprit, a lung biopsy or a liver biopsy or a renal biopsy whatsoever. Or if you had some uh, suspicion, you may do a skin biopsy looking at the uh, epidermis and the dermis being stored in a culture media. So this is what would happen by what we mean as a metabolic autopsy. Now, many a times the death happens at home and then you see this baby. And then you have an option of what is called as a verbal autopsy. Now, verbal autopsy is uh, trying to ascertain the cause of death based on questioning. And you need the standardized tool. And normally you would use a WHO neonatal uh, performa for sudden death. So there are three sections. You have to be trained in making use of this uh, tool of verbal autopsy. First section is to do with the socio-epidemic uh, uh, data. The second is to do with the neonatal perinatal data. And the third is the narrative. Now, based on this, you would come to a conclusion as to what was the probable cause of death and which is a simple tool in low cost settings where you do not have access to autopsy or a metabolic autopsy. So you would do what is called as a verbal autopsy. So these are uh, ways and means by which you would uh, look at uh, a clinical autopsy, a medical legal autopsy, a metabolic autopsy, or a verbal autopsy. And the fifth thing that I learned yesterday was a social autopsy. Now, there is a pro forma based on uh, the purpose here is to identify what led to the poor uh, response for uh, medical care. So, what societal factors uh, came in the way of uh, provision of care for this uh, newborn? So, that is more for socio-epidemic research scientists to lay down the priorities. But I think uh, one of these ways, what would be able to identify yeah, many a times point. do anything and everything, you may not be able to pinpoint. But point here is uh, we must make an attempt to identify uh, a genetic is something which is under-recognized, uh, which is missed. And lastly, uh, a metabolic autopsy, as I said, especially this is a third degree consanguineous baby. And especially if you have lost it after 24 hours, more the reason that you should not miss a uh, metabolic disorder. The, uh, so you have covered everything, sir, here. And that was very informative. So, so I just wanted to ask this autopsy, suppose this clinical autopsy is a problem. Medical legal autopsy is, at times is, uh, is, is possible. So you have given some options that taking samples, uh, biopsies that can do. Uh, but clinical autopsy, it is very difficult in a tier three cities. It becomes very difficult because there are no medical colleagues. So at that particular time, where these clinical autopsies can be done? So that was uh, how uh, that, that is a practical no. problem. Yeah, clinical autopsy is in the domain of pathologists. You need a trained pathologist to interpret. Yes. See, and uh, I recollect at JJ we had a uh, pathologist who was just looking only at neonatal autopsies because it's a totally different world. So unless and until you are aware about the histopathology of a newborn or for that matter, a perinatal uh, fetus, uh, then only it is worthwhile. Doing it just uh, it's like uh, doing it from anybody, uh, it's not worth uh, trying to, I mean, it's not worth spending uh, energy on it then otherwise, if you are not trained in looking at this. You may do, somebody may do an autopsy, but the histopathology is to be interpreted by the right person. Definitely. So, so we need a trained person to do this uh, neonatal clinical autopsies. So uh, there are time constraints, but uh, we try to touch many aspects of this perinatal care uh, from uh, pre premature uh, delivering of a premature baby, uh, baby with birth asphyxia, the asphyxia mimics, a neonatal death in the uh, in a ward or the similar cases that we see where. Uh, there is a death within four to five uh, days of life and they are brought uh, dead to our hospital and what should we do at that particular time. So uh, I, along with that, Dr. Chinmay, uh, sir, you have, uh, uh, like, uh, you have given very uh, crisp points 
regarding the antenatal uh, many antenatal conditions i wanted to discuss more but we, now the time that we are offered or what we have given we have almost utilized that time and uh, one thing i wanted from each one of you one message from each expert for better coordination and outcome of the baby so uh, vaishal you want me can can give us a message yeah i i am a pure obstetrician and um, i think the most important thing for management is a uh, good communication in a multidisciplinary team wherever you are even in the uh, in a metro city or in the periphery is always better to talk to your uh, pediatrician maybe fetal medicine consultant and uh, your team and important key factor is patient a uh, couple itself so that uh giving them an opportunity to make a informed choices that is what is most important uh prita madam your message yeah so i wanted to <laughs> emphasize that it's extremely important that the neonatologist and the obstetrician have these dialogues prior before talking to the family and it's good if they can talk together to the family when we are finding you know certain high risk conditions it's good that we talk together to the family regarding duration of stay you know when we are transparent with them things become easy later on even if the child doesn't do well they have the full understanding that the team is working together on this um having a coffee once in a while with obstetrician is a good idea i think we should do that. yes the call it's good <laughs> well <laughs> so the uh, uh, sir dr umar ji sir what is your uh, Uh, yeah so as you rightly said so and uh, the mams uh, coordination amongst ourselves as well as coordination with the patient so i think uh, there is huge role for antenatal counseling so that patient is aware that there could be surprises in some babies also support groups so that after delivery if there are surprises there are other patients to help her out yeah good sir thank you uh, thakre sir what is your message for us if you want to get the preterms to a good start there is only one thing that will help them and that is especially for <laughs> low resource setting like ours and that is a course of antenatal steroids unfortunately if we look at the national statistics not even half of our preterms uh, get the course of antenatal steroids so that's uh, one key intervention which we have to look at second is what preeta used one word that was team and to me team stands for together everyone achieves more and uh, that is something that uh, by team i mean uh, we always look at uh, uh, pediatrician obstetricians but the team here the key factor the decision makers are not we but the parents because we have to give them an informed uh, uh, complete information and then they have to take a final call so teamwork and antenatal steroids thank you very much all the experts It was a nice uh, session. There were a lot of uh, take-home messages, new things here. Shakri, you wanted to add something. You want to talk something about? Okay. So uh, that the the topic is vast. We may need, we we will need a lot many uh, such perinatal meets on specific topics. Uh, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, and crisp messages also. So to understand each other. better for the outcome of our babies now um, I, I, uh, thank you everybody i will hand over the session to uh, deepa madam thank you uh, i think that was a wonderful session and uh, the expertise of all our experts must have definitely uh, helped and benefited all, all the practitioners who are watching this session Uh, I definitely agree that this has to be a multi-disciplinary team, which includes not just the, the pediatricians and gynecologists, but also the parents should be in the circle right from the beginning. And, uh, I would also request uh, uh, Dr. Gangolia sir, uh, and also that we should be also involving the Foxy team, and we can have more such perinatal uh, uh, sessions so that we can have a better coordination between us. Uh, just one. Uh, question uh, to gangolia sir because he is also a medical legal expert so when we advise uh, i have clinical uh, postmortem in this unit most of the times they are not ready for this 
they don't give the concept. So is it necessary that we go for a MLC in these cases and uh, we need to go for a medical legal uh, uh, postmortem? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Deepa. Actually, that I was going to speak because what Dr. Rishika sta stated, all the types of aut autopsies. So the first thing I would like to state that before I answer your question, uh, before the, the there are lots of gray area in our this perinatology things. Of course, there should be very good coordination, communication between obstetricians and pediatricians. Often, I have seen so many examples where there is a blame game going around whenever any issue happens and goes to the court of law. The recent incidents where the baby was delivered and it was still but the neonatologist has seen, but he refused to write the notes on it. So that is very tricky situation. Of course, that is not the, <clears throat> this we cannot discuss here that, but these are the blame game which are, so we should have a good communication. Then the another thing is very important because in this so many ifs and words are there, there should be documentation should be very properly. And whatever is you are informing the parents that informed communication should be documented on the paper with their signatures and our signatures too. And it should be a real time um, the information given and real time signature should be there with the dates and time specified. That is very important. <clears throat> and of course, what Dr. Rishikesh Thakri said, parents also to be involved in counsel properly and there they come in the picture of the taking the decision. So decision makers, we and um, obstetrician, that is the teamwork which has to be done properly. And uh, these things, because this blame game does, does happen, and one more thing I will suggest because that was idea because after, uh, I think so 10 years before we had a, a physical um, CME where we had a sous-sanguard between obstetrician and uh, pediatrician. So now it's online, it's very easier. So we can get, we can get, get good experts to have a uh, discussion on these issues. So my suggestion was this, or I, may I suggest with Foxy as well as uh, IAP, uh, they should formulate some guidelines. What are the case scenarios were stated by Dr. Amul sir? Thinking in that in view of this, suppose this happens, what should be the guidelines? Of course, guidelines are not mandatory to be followed, but still that guidelines can help in the court of law because court of law generally follows the standard textbooks and protocols. But then if we have these guidelines, at least they will support something to be done. To be done. And secondly, what called ABG was stated, there's definitely double edged sword. So that should be also defined because otherwise we are feeding the, the this uh, patient, the how there's a how to can they, they that will be the reason set in the because they have not done the called ABG. And so that can be make the allegation on the our team. So that should be also defined properly, whether uh, it, because it's double agent, we don't know, don't know. We are seeing that there may not be HIE, but if it turns against us, that will be a huge problem for the obstetrician. So that is the, and that is also the, has to be defined properly. So because there are so many gray areas in there, but then the guidelines with support of the literature is the most important thing to be defined. So coming to the question, what Dr. Madam has asked, uh, and also Dr. Rishikesh Thakri stated that if the newborn is brought uh, or a neonate is brought from the home in a dead condition, whether verbal, after doing verbal autopsy, one can give the death certificate yes or no. And if that, if anything, there is foul play in that, whether this, that will hold in the court of law. So in that, that appears a little bit dicey to me. And therefore, whenever we cannot, I do not know how much true or that whatever the, I, I am not aware of the, whatever the protocol only, what pro guideline, what the word used Dr. Rishi has Thakare, which uh, tools. So what tools is we are using to do the verbal autopsy, whether there are, it is accepted by um, court of law or not. IAP, or, uh, yes or no, I do not know that. So Dr. Rishi has Thakare may say about that. But after doing that, using that tool, whether if we can define the cause of death and putting that as a cause of death on the certificate, whether it will help court true in the means will be, uh, it will help right in the court of law or not. Basic thing, what I feel as a as, as a generalized because this is a specific question as a generalized whenever the dead patient is brought and when we have we have not examined and we don't know the cause of that. The ideal situation is to inform the police and the police will decide what to do. And probably that is the medical legal autopsy only. And whether it involves, because medical legal autopsy, are, of course, involves everything. It is an involves chemical analysis, 
of course the correction of the blood whatever the doctor rishik is uh, stated regarding metabolic autopsy that can be done that blood can be collected but that can be given to the hand over the police after informing that we cannot give the cause of that probably inform the police is the important thing and the same thing what now what the deepa firkes question was that if we are insisting on pm because we are not knowing the cause of death and the relatives are refusing what to do that is the most important thing happens in generally the uh, this uh, in the cases of newborn units so in that case again in, if you are in corporate hospital or the hospital or the government hospital you have to inform your superior authority ki we are uh, we want to do autopsy but their parents are not ready to do that so involve the authority of the hospital involve the um, things of the if it is private hospital where there is no authority in that then the informing police is the best option because and let them decide then the question comes where if they uh, tell no then we have to make the paper but that paper will be made by the police and they will ask them to sign the papers refusing the post mortem because we don't have any role to play in that once we we when once we cannot give the cause of death informing police is the best option and whether to do an autopsy or not the police and parents will decide that is the way to go because ultimately what is the things see why why, why these things appear we always think that uh, we have little bit soft corner towards the parents and these things are a kyun autopsy karna hoga but that should not we should always in this era we should try to save our skin that is the most important and keeping transparent things everything is the most important thing and therefore i think so probably informing and doing the medical legal autopsy is the best option to do thank you sir it was a very clear message by dr gangulia sir and uh, now we are at the end of the session we conclude the session um the dr deepa before you end uh, there yes. well, there's one question in this um, i saw in the chat was by dr samir and if samir is also he can ask that question that question was addressed to dr umar ji when he said that there is he is having some authority at the board at a pune who decides then whether if the uh, termination of pregnancy while doing at 32 weeks if the approved by board and it turns to be life born what to do Mr. Yes, Mr. Yes. Sir, thanks for the excellent question. So, uh, when they say termination, it means termination. If it is a life born, it's going to be a chaos. Uh, so, you take proper consent, uh, give them intracardiac KCL, stop the heart, and then deliver. And in the Western world, it is followed for every baby beyond twenty-two weeks, which we follow in our center as well. Okay. Hope so. Samir got the answer, and if he's there, he can ask uh, coronary questions if he's having. Probably is not one there. More. One more question. Uh, there's a 38-year-old by Dr. Sachin Kore, 38-year-old female child, and uh, she's showing a AFF of four to five with a uterine placental insufficiency. So, what should be the right time for elective seizure or? Uh, Only elective caesarean section. Doctor Vaishali Zushi, can you just answer this question? Ah, uh, thirty-four weeks. It depends on what is the grade of uterine placental insufficiency. In ah uh, current era and ah uh, thirty-four weeks, um, with a good fetal weight. Ah, uh, if there is a absent endastolic ah uh, flow, ah uh, then she definitely needs a delivery by C-section. Yeah. I think um, that's the question. Ma'am, if I can just add to this. Yeah. Um, yes. So, um, it says near term, not thirty-four weeks. I'm uh, sorry, I did old. not hear that. I and, uh, no, yeah. no, no worries, ma'am. Yeah. Um, and I, I would just like to add over here that near term, if I have five, would be normal. So, or yes. four for that matter. So, uh, I would urge everybody to use nomograms. If you have one second, maybe I can just share the screen and. Show you how a nomogram for uh, AFI looks like. So this is nomogram for the kidney, and as you can see, uh, around three point five to say around seven ish is considered normal. As uh, Rishikesh sir said, uh, uh, anterior posterior diameter of the kidneys, and this is the nomogram for the like uh, sorry, and an AFI of even four at forty weeks. Would be considered normal, 
so i would urge all our practitioners here to resort to nomograms and don't go by numbers um that's about it um delivery decision of course vaishali ma'am will tell us it will be great if you just uh, share it this graph with uh, dr amol so that we can circulate it in our work. certainly ma'am thank you so much so yes we are uh, will conclude this session here and our um, uh, dr deepa dr deepa dr deepa excuse me dr deepa excuse me one thing more Uh, because Dr. Umarji is doing a wonderful work at Pune. One more thing, I would like to ask. Suppose scan any scan, whatever the routine scan, maybe the routine for primary level scan, for sonography or the advanced scan. If they show any anomaly, and whatever the means, example of the congenital, what what are heart problems, what's way, whatever was stated. Uh, but uh, even though we counsel everything with the, all the advances available. if parent insist on termination what is the take on that uh, again government of india has made their job very easy for us sir. so there is a list of anomalies for which termination is allowed <laughs> so i'll uh, share that list as well in the new guideline so you can just say that it is not included there we can't do anything if you want to go to government uh, and i do that for every anomaly even at 18 weeks if it is not in the list i don't offer termination yes but still some of the parents they, then they go to the court of law and they ask them to file the case for getting this though it is not mentioned in the list so it will be proper it probably dr umar ji if you can share the that list it will be a useful for yes. every pediatrician yes sir and of course court of law is far superior to any individual practitioner or in general anybody so if the honorable court says we would obviously oblige yes Yeah. one more important message is there whenever you see once anything on the sonography whatever you have to not sure about but explain the things properly what does it mean and what does it mean and it may not turn out to be that but it may turn also seriously everything should be uh, explained crystal clear everything in the in the way they understand and in this cases it's better always to take one more opinion and advise them one more opinion that doesn't make any harm to us it will increases our all um, this uh, information added together it will help us to in the uh, problematic cases yes sorry dr deepa interfering between yes. dr amol has dr Dr. Amol has uh, left probably because of uh, yes, certain yes. calls, email, sir. So excellent work done. I think so. Dr. Jay Bhandarkar is there? Yes, sir. Dr. Jay, are you here? Yes. Uh, Deepa, yes. madam, you, do you want to say something or do you want to proceed to vote of thanks? Dr. Jay, sir, can you uh, just give the vote of thanks? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, at the outset, I uh, thank our my IP own. Or uh, uh, excellent uh, activities during this newborn period. Actually, we should uh, continue all this uh, other activity. The newborn period is daily. Daily, uh, he should do the important things for the newborn. And thanks to our uh, uh, all experts, Dr. Umarji, uh, Dr. Vaishali Madam, and uh, Dr. Rushikesh Thakre uh, for uh, giving this wonderful time for this very important subject. Dr. Pritha Madam. Dr. Pritha. And, Dr. Pritam, sorry, uh, from uh, Kolkata, and uh, thanks to all both moderator, Dr. Amol and Dr. Deepa for excellent moderation, the selection of excellent cases and excellent discussion, and uh, thanks to all the audience and all the office bearers as well as our digital uh, support by uh, Pallavi Madam from Nasik, and thank you for uh, <coughs> attending this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our new on week thank today, you. and uh, thank you very much.